Um, so it's a, it's a smooth projective variety, which I'm going to call M, such that the following two properties hold. So first of all, uh, I want the space of two forms on M to be one dimensional, and I want it to be spanned by a symplectic form. So here, omega is a non-degenerate two form. And second of all, I want M to be simply connected. <clears throat> okay, so that's the definition of a, of a hyperkähler variety. And um, maybe I can just recall for you this, uh, this um, well-known theorem which says that these are sort of one of the building blocks for k-trivial varieties. So the, the theorem which justifies this definition or justifies the importance of it is the, uh, the so-called Beauville-Bogomolov decomposition theorem, which says the following. So the theorem um, so let's say that we start with uh, some smooth projective variety X and let's assume that it has trivial canonical bundle um, then what this theorem says is that up to a finite etal cover, this X splits as a product of three types of varieties. So explicitly, um, so there exists a finite etal cover um, by a product of some varieties which I'll call MI, the X. <coughs> where each of these guys is one of the following types. Okay, so let me do it on the next board. Uh, so maybe the first one I can fit here, actually. So the first type is an abelian variety. The second type is a is a Clavial variety. Okay, and here when I say Clavial, I mean like a, a strict Clavial variety. So, in other words, I want there to be no p forms um, in the range where there doesn't have to be a p form. So when p is between zero and the dimension. And the third type is a, is a hyperkähler variety. So the third type is hyperkähler. Okay, so in, so in this sense, right, hyperkähler varieties are one of the building blocks for k-trivial varieties, so we'd like to classify them. And maybe I can just say, you know, abelian varieties, I would say, are pretty well understood in some sense. You know, topologically, they're all just tori. But, but two, two and three, Clavial varieties and hyperkähler varieties, are much more mysterious, I think. And there are still a lot of open questions about both of them. For instance, you know, there are like zillions of Clavial varieties, and physicists have made like, yeah, zillions of them, which somehow correspond to our universe or whatever. But in particular, we don't know anything about like boundedness of topological type or boundedness in general, although there is some interesting work by Burkhar and friends um, on those kind of problems. So, so yeah, there's a lot of interesting questions here. And for hyperkähler varieties, there are also a lot of interesting questions. But in some sense, it's like the opposite. Instead of having zillions of examples, we have very few uh, examples of hyperkähler varieties. So I want to tell you, that's sort of the focus of today's talk. I want to first tell you, just remind you about the examples we do know, and then um, an idea of how we could construct more or maybe a different way of thinking about these examples. So that's where we're, where we're going. <coughs> Is everyone happy with that? Okay. Yeah, in this talk, I'll be considering algebraic ones. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let me just remind you of the, uh, the sort of known examples of hyperkähler varieties. So, examples of hyperkählers. Okay, the first one, I'll call it zero. It's a kind of silly. But uh, let me just mention, right, that just from the definitions, in dimension two, hyperkähler is the same as being uh, a K3 surface. 
test. And I think, uh, yeah, I think everyone here knows about K what a K3 surface is, but literally it's just that when the dimension is two is one definition of a K3 surface, right? So for instance, you could have S and P3, uh, a smooth degree four hypersurface. That's an example of a K3. So in dimension two, hypercalories are well understood. They're, they're K3 surfaces. Um, and what about in higher dimensions? What are some examples? So this is an example. <coughs> This is our first real example. I'll call this example one. So example one is going to be a construction that takes as input a K3 surface. So let's say that I give you uh, a K3 S. Then I'll tell you two different constructions you can do, A and B. So the first one, uh, A, is you can take the Hilbert scheme uh, of points on S. And that thing turns out to be a... Uh, a, a, hyper, a hypercalor variety. You can sort of descend the two form on the product of the S's down to the, down to the Hilbert scheme. So that's, uh, you know, that's an example in every dimension. Well, maybe I should say, right, a hypercalor variety has to have even dimension because it has a symplectic form. So you get examples in every dimension in that way. Uh, here's a slightly more fancy way to say this example and, uh, and a little bit more. So instead of just taking a Hilbert scheme, you could consider a moduli space. Uh, of sheaves on S. So MHSV is going to be my notation for the moduli space of H stable coherent sheaves uh, of class V. Okay, and let me. Uh, Right, let me just say what does this notation here mean? So wh where does V live? So there are different ways to formulate it. You know, the classical way is to say V is an element in cohomology and you look at things whose Chern class is given by that element in cohomology. I'm gonna say it in a slightly different way which will be useful for, for later. So let me say it like this. So here V, so V is an element in what's called the numerical K theory of S. And by definition, that's the following group. So you take the, um, <coughs> the growth and D group of coherent sheaves on S, and you mod out by the kernel of a natural pairing on that group. So you mod out by the kernel of chi. So what is chi? Chi is the pairing which for coherent sheaves E and F, you just take the alternating sum of the X group. So this is sum over I negative one to the i of x i from e to f. So this defines a pairing on this, uh, on this group, right? The, the growth and D group is just isomorphism classes of coherent sheaves modulo, modulo the relation that if you have an exact sequence, the middle one is the sum of the outer two. So you have this group, you have this pairing on it, you can mod out by the kernel of that pairing and you get something called the numerical K theory. And so uh, if you have a coherent sheaf, it has a class in this group, right? And um, this moduli space, it depends on two parameters. First, it depends on this class V here. And to make this thing a uh, hypercalar, to make it smooth, you should take this to be a primitive uh, element of this lattice, so it's not divisible. So you take an element in this lattice which is not divisible, and you take H here <coughs> to be an ample divisor on S. And uh, in order to get this, this moduli space to be smooth, you have to take it to be sufficiently generic with respect to V. And what that means is that, you know, if you have a coherent sheet, if you just try to parameterize all coherent sheaves, that's some crazy moduli space. So you need to impose a stability condition. So H stability says that you have no subsheaves of, of bigger slope. And uh, if you take a sufficiently generic ample divisor, the notions of stability and semi-stability will coincide and you'll get a, a project, you'll get a projective smooth moduli space. So, uh, so th that's the setup for forming this moduli space. You have this data. And, um, and this thing here is hypercalar variety. This is a hypercalar variety of dimension <clears throat> given by an explicit formula. So it's V paired with V plus two. Okay, and what do I mean by V paired with V here? So by definition, um, I'm going to define a pairing 
on this lattice, k nu, it's kind of silly, but it's sort of historical. It's just the, the negative of this Euler pairing. Okay, so you have this Euler pairing because I quotient by the kernel, I get a non-degenerate pairing on here given by chi, and negative it is what I call brackets. And the dimension of the moduli space is just given by this explicit formula. Okay, any questions about this example? So this is one really nice way to get hyperkähler varieties, and maybe I should mention that uh, example A is actually a special case of example B. If you parameterize the, the length and subscheme by its ideal sheaf, you can realize it as a moduli space of, uh, of stable sheaves on your K3. What was that? Uh huh. Yeah, you could take sheaves supported on a curve. You could take sheaves supported on a curve. Yeah, that's true. And then you could get you would get something like a uh, like if you take a family of curves on the K three and take the Jacobians of the curves, you'll get a hyperkähler variety, and this will give you some compactification of that, which is hyperkähler. Yeah. 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 So this is really a more general than than example A. Um, this B. Yeah, sure. Uh, mm. Primitive would mean, so I'd have to think for a minute. It just means that the churn class, so if you're, yeah, if you're taking things supported on some curve, then you're, you're basically looking at the churn class of the, say I is the inclusion of this curve, of the push forward of some, some class V, say W on the curve. So you just want that to be primitive. So I think maybe if you take a, I think maybe if the curve is primitive in cohomology, then that will be okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. So that's, um, that's maybe the first interesting construction of hyperkähler varieties, uh, these moduli spaces. There's another kind of similar thing that you can do. Uh, so this is example two. And for example two, instead of taking a K3 as an, as an input, we're going to take an abelian surface. So for A, an abelian surface. Uh, and again, there will be sort of two different things that you can do. One will involve a Hilbert scheme. So the first thing you could do is you could look at the Hilbert scheme of n plus one points on A. And uh, this thing itself turns out not to be hyperkähler when you have an abelian variety. And it's because there's sort of, a, of an, a, there's an abelian factor in there. And so you can get rid of it by doing the following thing. So you can map down to the symmetric power of A. And then from there, there's a summation map to the uh, abelian surface itself. So you get a map like this. <clears throat> Let me call that map S. And then I'll define whom N of A to be the fiber of this map over zero. Okay, and um, this is a, uh, a hyperkähler variety of dimension 2A. Okay, so it's very similar to the first example, but you have to get rid of this abelian factor. Um, whoops. And let me do the second, another way you can think about this in terms of moduli of sheaves is as follows. You could take M, H, A, V. Um, so H and V are exactly as above. And um, you could look at the Albanese of this variety. And it turns out that the target of the Albanese map is A dual times A. There's an explicit way to say that what this map is. You take a complex here, you, or not a complex, take a coherent sheaf. You can take its determinant. That'll give you something in a hat. In a hat. And then the other, how do you get something in A itself? There's an equivalence between A and A dual given by the Poincaré line bundle on the product. So you can take your coherent sheaf, move it to a complex on A dual, and then take the determinant of that complex, and you'll get something in A. So there's an explicit way to describe this map. But you know, abstractly, it's just the Albanese morphism. And um, I'll define K sub H 
of AV to be the, uh, uh, the fiber of this Albanese over zero. <coughs> and this guy turns out to be a hypercalar variety of dimension, V paired with V minus two. Okay, there's some kind of, it looks a little asymmetric in A and B, it's just because here you've, you fix the, deter the determinant is trivial when you take the ideal sheaf of n plus one points. That's why it looks a little different in A and B. Okay, so these are two uh, classic examples, and there are two other classical examples, so I'll call them three and four. I won't say much about these. They're kind of, they're kind of very special isolated examples due, due to O'Grady. And basically what you do is you try to do what you did in example one or two, but you do it where V is not primitive. You get a singular moduli space, and then you can ask if there's a symplectic resolution of it. And what O'Grady showed is that in two very special cases, there is a symplectic resolution. Specifically, if you do it on a K3, if you look at a moduli space of the form MHS2V, where V is primitive and, uh, and it's square, is two, then this thing admits, it turns out, a symplectic resolution, which is a hypercalar variety. And its dimension is 10. So the, the same dimension formula works. So the dimension here will be 10, which is uh, if, you, if you square this uh, and add two, you get 10. It, well, I'm not specifying exactly what it is. He shows that there exists a symplectic resolution. There exists a resolution. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, there exists one. So I'm being a little bit vague. I'm not telling you exactly the construction. Yeah. So yeah, there exists a resolution of this space over which the symplectic form extends. Um, that's what O'Grady proved. And then he also proved, so this is example four, that you can do a similar thing. <clears throat> so again, this is O'Grady on an abelian surface. <clears throat> when you have a vector of square two. And so this guy is hypercalar of uh, dimension six. Dimension six. That's known. Yeah, so O'Grady showed that. From, I'm not sure if it was O'Grady who showed that, maybe O'Grady and some other people, but it's known these are the only two Vs you're allowed to take to where there exists a symplectic resolution. Yeah, that's right. Okay, cool. So those are really the main examples. Uh, hmm which are known. So specifically, so the precise statement, let me write this as a remark. So the remark, there'll be two remarks. The first remark is that examples one through four um, give all known deformation classes uh, of hypercalar varieties. Okay, and just to give a name for them, from now on in this talk, uh, I'll call the, the ones that appear. If you have a hypercalar variety, which is deformation equivalent to something as an example one, I'll call that a K3N type hypercalar. So K3N is my terminology for things in example one. K3N type maybe. Coomer type is for hypercalar deformation equivalent to something as an example two. And similarly, I'll use OG10 and OG6, so the things in examples three or four. Okay, so those are the only deformation classes that are known. That's a little bit surprising, I think, given that people have tried for a while to make more. And uh, I'm not sure. I think, I would say most people believe there are more, actually. We just haven't been able to construct them. But yeah, so that's one of the, the biggest questions in the subject, is are there more? Okay, and let me tell you a sort of related but, but easier question to this one. So this is the second remark. Um, so let me call MHK the moduli space um, of polarized hypercalars. Okay, and you know, this thing exists if you fix the dimension and the degree of the polarization. There's a quasi-projective variety. But, you know, if you want, you can consider the union of all of them. You have this huge space, moduli space of all polarized hypercalars. And uh, I just want to say, 
what, is, what does it look like locally, this space? Or in other words, like, what is the dimension of this space at a, at a fixed point? That's just some deformation theory computation. So you can ask yourself, what is the dimension at a point x comma h of this, uh, of this moduli space? And uh, yeah, by deformation theory, what this is, is it's h11 of x minus 1. You know, in this case, that agrees with h1 of tx because it's symplectic. So it's like the deformations of x, and then you fix the polarization, so you have one less. So it, it turns out this, this moduli space has this dimension. And we, let's just contemplate what is that dimension in each of these cases I mentioned here. So it's some explicit computation you can do. Uh, and what do you get? What was that? Is it, ah, uh, uh, yeah, I think, yeah, yeah, that's right. So at least at the, you know, if you look at a component and you look at the generic point of that component, this will be, it'll be smooth there. And that's the dimension there, yeah, yeah. There could be multiple components, I guess, which intersect in the moduli space, yeah, yeah. That's right, yeah, 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 right. Um, oh, sorry, so, so let me just list what these dimensions are. OG6. Okay, so there's some computation you can do, and what it ends up being in these cases is 20, 4, uh, 21, and 5. Okay, and uh, I mean, yeah, I don't know. It's, you know, there's some explicit construction. You can compute these numbers. And I want to compare that to the uh, number of parameters. in the construction. Um, okay, so right in the first construction, what I gave you was a, K, a polarized K, uh, you need a projective K3 surface. So there are 19 parameters that go into that one. Uh, in the second one, I needed you know, an algebraic uh, abelian surface. So there are three parameters there. And similarly here, you know, you had 19 and 3, because again, they depended on a K3 and an abelian surface. And so you could ask sort of where, is there a way to describe these missing dimensions? And that's sort of the second question I want to write, write down. Um, so question two is a little bit vague, but how to understand the uh, missing dimensions. So the dimensions that we can't see from the constructions that I've given you. And uh, the goal of this talk is sort of to explain one way that you can try to do that in terms of these things which are called uh, CY2 categories. And I mean, the, the basic idea, right, is that uh, essentially what we want, the input for this construction was like a K3 surface. So I want some way to deform the K3 surface to something which is still algebraic in some sense. Um, and where I can take moduli spaces. And the way that we'll do it is we'll end up deforming the derived category of the K3 surface to something which is no longer the derived category of a K3, but for which you can still make sense of moduli spaces of objects. Okay, so that's where we're going. So let me tell you what, what a CY2 category is. Are there any questions before I keep going? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I'm not sure I know the, I, there probably are things that are known and I just don't know the answer to that. Um, I mean, yeah, so let me not try to say anything. I have, I have not personally studied the question of compactifying them, yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, okay. Maybe one thing which I should mention, though, is that th there is some very precise control in this space because there is a there is a Torelli theorem for like the smooth ones, at least that Verbitsky proved. And so these moduli spaces are very close to the period domain for the hypercalers. It's not exactly an isomorphism like it is for K3s, but it's close to being an isomorphism onto the period domain. Um, but yes, yeah, so that doesn't answer your question, but. Okay, so yeah, so let me tell you what a CY2 category is. <clears throat> so I'll give you sort of the abstract definition, but maybe the more interesting thing will be the examples. 
But here's the, the abstract definition. So a two-dimensional Calabial uh, so I'll just call this CY2 category is <clears throat> and okay so I'm gonna say something in this so it's an enhanced triangulated category C, uh, such that a few conditions hold. Okay, if you, you know, triangulated categories aren't so good, so if you really want a notion that works, you should say like DG category or something here. But you can pretty safely ignore this for the talk, but I just didn't want to lie. So you have a triangulated category C, such that first of all, C is smooth and proper. So there's some abstract definition of what it means for like a DG category to be smooth and proper. Again, you don't need to know what that means. Let me just say, for instance, this is true. If your category C arises as a subcategory of the bounded derived category of coherent sheaves on X, where X is a smooth projective variety, and this embedding of your category is what's called admissible. Admissible just means that this inclusion admits an adjoint. Um, but I'm gonna give you explicit examples. So again, I'm not gonna lose you here if you're not familiar with these terms. So it's some nice subcategory of the derived category of a variety. And then the really essential part of the definition is part two, uh, which says that the ser functor of this category is equal to the shift by two. And explicitly, that just means that ser duality holds in a form that it, you know, in a form that looks exactly like Sarah duality does on a surface with trivial canonical bundle. So this is isomorphic to OMS from F into E shifted by two. Cool. Okay, so yeah, abstractly, it's a triangulated category that sits in some nice way in the derived category of a variety. And homologically, it looks like the derived category of a K3 or an abelian surface. And the interesting thing is that there are sort of non-trivial examples of these kind of categories. And they appear like supernaturally, I would say. So let me try to give you some examples, which will uh, bring this down to earth if you haven't thought about these kind of things before. Well, the first example is kind of, again, a stupid one. A really stupid example is you could take C to be DX, uh, where X is K3 or abelian uh, surface. Okay, that's silly, that's true. Uh, another more interesting example, and probably the most famous one, uh, is, a K th is a CY2 category which is associated to a cubic fourfold. So this is uh, the one which was introduced by Sasha Kuznetsov and uh, studied because of its relations to the rationality problem. But I, I, won't, exact, I won't talk about the rationality problem today. So, our first real example is what I call Q of X. So this is called the uh, Kuznetsov component. And here X inside of P5 is a cubic fourfold. And so what is this category explicitly? So it arises as a piece of the derived category of X. So there's a, a semi-orthogonal decomposition that looks as follows. Okay, and it's okay, if you've never thought about semi-orthogonal decompositions, that's okay. I'm gonna tell you exactly what this category is. So it's a subcategory of DX that consists of all objects uh, which receive no derived Toms from O, O of one, or O of two. So if you want, a really concrete way to say that is you look at the cohomology of E twisted by negative I, and I want this coherent cohomology to vanish when I is zero, one, or two. Okay, so it's sort of the things which are orthogonal to these objects. Um, they receive no homs from these objects. Is that okay? So that's the definition of a subcategory. And uh, Kuznetsov introduced this thing and he showed that it's in fact a CY2 category. 
Okay. Again, that's not obvious, but it turns out to be true that that's a CY2 category. And um, let me do one other example, uh, for now at least. So this is example two. What's that? Yes. Yeah, you do. So if you, <clears throat> one way to think about uh, the symplectic form on this space, for instance, is the tangent space, say you have a coherent sheaf E, what does the tangent space at that point look like? It looks like x1 of e, e times e to, e to itself. And there's a natural pairing from x1 of E, E with itself to x2 of E, E. And if E is a simple object, meaning that the homs from it to itself are, are, the, are the scalars, then this x2 will also be the scalars because of the serial duality property. And that's one way to describe the symplectic form on, uh, on this moduli space. So the, you know, the symplectic form is really just coming from this homological property whenever you're parameterizing objects that are simple in the sense that homs from E to itself are, are the copy of the scalar. Yeah. Uh, where'd my eraser go? Oh yeah. So, so let me just give you, there, there are sort of a bunch of these kind of examples nowadays uh, of these kind of Kuznetsov components. Maybe I'll just mention one other one. Uh, which is the, the, the other example, which is sort of very well understood now. Um, so this is an example two. So C is the Kuznetsov component of some other Fano variety. In general, you can define lots of these kind of Kuznetsov components for Fano varieties. And in very nice cases, they end up being CY2. Um, so if you take something which is called a crucial and chi, Fourfold. So this is a specific kind of Fano fourfold. At least a generic one can be written as follows. If you take the Grossmannian 2 5, that sits inside of P9 by the Pluker embedding, and then you just intersect it with a hyperplane and a quadric inside of there. And you get a Fano fourfold. And it turns out that this Fano fourfold has, again, a nice semi orthogonal decomposition with one piece, which is a CY2 category. And then the other pieces are just some, some vector bundles. So here U is the, um, is the, uh, the restriction of the rank two bundle on the Grossmannian to X. So it doesn't, it's not really so important what the exact decomposition is, but I'm just saying there are some other interesting classes of Fano varieties where you can find CY2 categories inside of them. And this is all sort of some part of a program that Sasha Kuznetsov has developed. And uh, so yeah, I won't mention the, the other ones, but there are some other examples like this. And here's sort of uh, one of the imp important theorems about these kind of categories. So the theorem, I'll state it in two parts. So for, for cubics, this is due to Sasha. And uh, for this example too, I, I proved this with him. And what it says is that in these examples, uh, the following two things hold. So first of all, if X is very general in moduli, then this, this category is not equivalent to D of Y for any variety Y. Okay, so there, there are really some non-geometric things for, for a generic Y, for a generic uh, X. And the second thing is that there exists special X such that this category is geometric, and in fact, it's equivalent to D of S, where S is a K3. Okay, so that's sort of a precise sense in which these categories satisfy the, my wish that I was expressing before. My wish to, was to find some way to deform the notion of a K3 surface. And this theorem is sort of expressing in a precise sense that uh, these categories are, are deformations of D of S. Any questions about this uh, theorem before I keep going? Uh, sorry, X is one of these varieties, either a cubic fourfold or one of these guys, and to them I can associate this category. You're going to see where, so I haven't gotten back to this picture. I'm going to get to it in a second. Yeah. The, the next thing I say will sort of answer part of that. I think we'll answer your question. 
Okay, maybe I won't prove this theorem for you, but like, I don't know, one is sort of not that hard if you know about, maybe I won't say it, there's just some invariant you can compute and it rules out the possibility of this. And this you prove by looking at some very specific y's and understanding their geometry. And somehow you can write down a derived equivalence between these categories. So I mean, there's some work that I'm hiding here, but the theorem, but. Um, let me try to tell you how, how this is related to exactly to this question I was bringing up before. So we've, we've sort of got, what I'm saying is we've now got our new parameters for a construction. There are these categories. So here's, um, here's a theorem which summarizes uh, the things which are known about moduli spaces of objects in these, uh, in these categories. So here's a theorem. So this is part of two works. One was a work with, uh, with a bunch of co-authors. So let me not miss any names. Beyer, Lahose, McCree, uh, Neuer, and Scolari. And then also I, I wrote a paper with um, Bertuzzi and Zhao. Bertuzzi. Okay, and this is a theorem that concerns exactly these two examples we were just talking about. So let's say that X is a, um, a cubic fourfold, or it's one of these Gusho Mokai fourfolds. So let X be either of those two type of things I just told you about. Um, and then we're going to fix data exactly like the data that went into the construction of uh, our hypercalar moduli spaces of sheets. So I'm going to fix. Uh, V, which is an element of the numerical K theory of X, which I'll demand is primitive. Okay, you know, this is defined exactly as, as I did for K3 surfaces. So if you have a triangulated category, you can form its growth and degroup. It's the three abelian group on isomorphism classes, modulo if you have an exact triangle, the middle term is the sum of the outer two. And then there's a pairing, there's an Euler pairing defined exactly like before. So this group makes sense. So you could take a you could take a class in there, which I'll call V. And I'll also fix um, sigma. So here's the part where I have to sort of hide some general theory. I'm going to fix a stability condition on on my category Q of X. So this is sort of uh, the way you should think of this is a stability condition is an analog of an ample line bundle. Basically, you can try to form a moduli space of objects in this category in class V, but it won't be well behaved. So you need some notion of stability that you impose on your objects, and Bridgeland isolated exactly the right notion of stability that you need to impose. So it's a little bit complicated to give you the actual definition. It also probably wouldn't help for the talk. So I'm just saying there's some extra data that you need, a stability condition, and it lets you form a well-behaved moduli space. So that's a... Uh, that's a little bit of a black box, but so the, the upshot is that if you fix this data, then you can form this moduli space. So again, this is the uh, moduli space. It's a moduli space that parameterizes objects, which are sigma stable in this category, and the class of this object has to be equal to V. So I can form this moduli space, and then you could ask, is it a, is it a well-behaved space? And the answer is it, ha it behaves just like in the case of a K3 surface. So this is a, a hypercalar variety of K3N type and dimension given by V paired with V plus 2. Okay, so it's, it's really exactly parallel to the case of... Uh, before when we were considering moduli of coherent sheaves on a K3 surface. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to say anything about the proof of this, but, like, well, very roughly it's because these categories do specialize to be of a K3 surface. So we develop some general theory of stability conditions in a family, and it sort of allows you to prove things about this moduli space by going to the case of D of S, where we already know something. It's one of these classical theorems. Um, okay, and... 
So, so that's a really good question. So I've hidden in the theorem the existence of these things. That's part of the theorem that they exist, yeah. In general, it's, it's not known that stability conditions exist. Um, okay, but let me tell you why this is uh, sort of interesting and why it's related to this question from before. <coughs> um, so, maybe I'll phrase this as a remark. Absolutely, yeah. So that's going to be related to the, I'm going to say, the answer is no, and I'll say that in, right now, yeah. But uh, yeah, they are still deformation equivalent because they're, they're K3N types. Um, that's a good question. The answer is that you, do you get sort of all of those extra 20 dimensions? The answer is no, but I'll say, I'll say something more about that in a second too. Yeah, they're all very good questions, yeah. Uh, so here's the remark. There are two things. The first is that there exists a sublattice, which I'll call L, inside of this um, inside of this uh, this numerical growth in D group. So for any for any cubic fourfold or for any GM fourfold, there always exists a nice sublattice, um, which I can write explicitly. In the case of a cubic fourfold, it's the, uh, a two lattice. So this is if x is a cubic. And in this GM case, you get this lattice here. So it's a rank two lattice that always includes into this numerical k-theory. And in fact, if x is very general, that's an equality, this inclusion here. So what I'm saying is that for any x, you always have like a bunch of choices of this v. And in particular, you see this, this pairing is getting arbitrarily big. So you can get moduli spaces of sort of any dimension that you want out of this from a, from a very general cubic fourfold using this construction. And uh, in, in particular, right, you can, so let's say that I fix some V and L, then what you end up getting out is a, uh, a 20 dimensional uh, family of polarized Hyperkähler varieties, um, namely exactly these moduli spaces that I was telling you about. So the reason it, you know, if you look at cubic fourfolds, they vary in a 20 dimensional family. So that's where this 20 is coming from here. Um, and in fact, it's kind of nice in this case, it's not just 20 dimensional, it's unirational. So that's kind of interesting. You sort of get maximal dimensional families which are, which are unirational. Uh, and so uh, you do get lots of 20 dimensional spaces, but you don't get all of them actually. Uh, one way you can see that is it's known if you fix the dimension and let the degree get big enough, then it becomes general type, these moduli, these moduli spaces. So you're only getting some of them via this kind of construction. Um, but uh, the conjectural picture is that, um, is that there should be like an infinite sequence of these kind of constructions. So here we've only given you two, cubic fourfolds and GM fourfolds. But there should exist a sort of an infinite sequence of families like this that fill out those 20 dimensions, uh, all of the other ones. And so, let's see, how am I doing on time? Okay, maybe I won't write remark one, uh, remark two. I'll just say it in words. Um, what I was gonna say in remark two is that <clears throat> you can use this to recover sort of classical constructions of hyperkähler varieties. Like, you may have thought about this example before. If you fix a cubic fourfold and you look at the Hilbert scheme of lines in it, that's a hyperkähler fourfold. Um, that's a really old example due to Beauville and Donaghy, I think. And you can realize that as one of these moduli spaces. Um, specifically, it's the moduli space for this vector of square two. So that, that moduli space is supposed to have dimension b squared plus two, so that's four. And it turns out that that's really the variety of lines on a cubic fourfold. So there were a couple sort of classical examples of these kind of things, but only like three or four of them, and they arise in this way too. So maybe I'll just say this recovers some classical constructions that were, that were previously studied. Okay, so that's the, uh, 
that's the story in this K3N type case. And for the, the end of the talk, I want to tell you about the Coomer case, which is sort of the new work. And in that case, it's, it's the best possible scenario where you really get all of those dimen four dimensional spaces. You don't just get two of these families, but you get all of them. Um, so let me state the, uh, the theorem. Are there any more questions about the sort of K3 type before I do the Coomer type? Is it for any type? Oh, that's a good question. So, um, so like if you, let me see if I'm, if I'm in, well, wait, let me see if I'm interpreting your question. You could ask, for instance, say you look at cubic fourfolds, you could ask what degree K3s come up in the equivalences like this, and it's not all of them. It's some infinite sequence of them, but it's not all degrees. Yeah, it's not all of them. Yeah, and it's, ex it's explicitly known. There's some specific, you know, infinite set of degrees that arise in this way. Yeah, it's expected for all of them. Yeah, you should, yeah. And uh, so let me state a theorem, which says that sort of the best possible thing does happen in the Coomer case. Oops. <coughs> okay. So this is work with um, Beyer, Aaron Beyer, and Pertuzzi, and Zhao. Okay, and so let me say it like this. So let's let's fix a component M uh, of the moduli space. of polarized hypercalers of Coomer type. Okay, and the statement is that, uh, so it's gonna be kind of a long statement, but roughly it's gonna say that this kind of picture that we had for cubic fourfold just always works uh, in this case. So there exists. So for any M, there exists, <clears throat> first of all, a map B from a, from a variety B uh, to M. So let me call this map F. And this is a finite and dominant map. And there also exists um, a CY2 category curly C over B. So let me say this and then I'll try to explain it. There also exists a stability condition on C over B. And finally, there exists a relative class in the numerical growth indie group for C over B, such that something holds. So before I tell you the conclusion, I, I haven't told you what these terms here mean. So there's some technical notion of a category over a base and a stability condition over a base and a numerical class over a base. But in particular, for any point in here, you get sort of a fiber, which is one of the things I told you about before. So let me say it like that. So in particular, whenever you have a point in the base, what I'm saying is that you have a CY category, C sub D, you have a stability condition sigma sub b on this category, and you have a numerical class v sub b in the numerical k theory of c sub b. Okay, and and these uh, these things satisfy the pro the following properties. So such that so I'm going to have to go to all the way on the other side, I guess. Uh, Okay, so any, for any component of the moduli of polarized hypercalers of Coomer type, there exists a CY2 category 
over some base that dominates this moduli space and a stability condition in a numerical class such that first of all, um, there is one other thing I wanted to write here. There's a special point in D, which I'll call zero. So first of all, this category over zero is equivalent to D of A, where A is an abelian, is an abelian surface. Okay, and second of all, <coughs> for any B, so for any B, I can try to do the, the kind of construction that we did when we looked at type, um, varieties constructed as modular space which sheaves on an abelian surface. So namely, I can look at the, uh, the Albanese, Albanese map from this moduli space. So I have this moduli space of objects in, uh, in the fiber over B. I can look at the Albanese morphism maps to some abelian fourfold, which I'll just call alb. And I can take its pre-image over zero. And let me call this uh, A sigma B CB comma V. Okay, so this is exactly analogous to what we did if I had an abelian surface. Take the fiber of the Albanese, and the statement is that this is a, uh, is a Coomer type uh, hyperkähler variety, which exactly corresponds to the point f of b in n. Okay, so I mean, I'm just saying that there is some finite cover of the moduli space, and over that finite cover, you have <coughs> the universal family becomes a moduli space of objects in CY2 categories. So it's, exact, it's sort of the optimal kind of theorem, saying that you can realize those extra dimensions always as moduli of objects in some uh, CY2 category. So are there any questions about the statement? I can end just by telling you a little bit about what the construction is. What was that? Oh, the, the, the fact that it's not just M on the nose? Uh, the way that the way that the B comes up, the the fact that it's not M comes up for a couple of reasons. One is that, like, to have a universal family, maybe you need to choose some level structure. But then the other reason is like, the other reason is a little bit technical. It has to do with some extension of a group action in a family, which I'll maybe I'll mention in right now. So I'm not sure if it's related to something like flops. I. Oh uh, yeah, this this M is yeah. It's closely related to the period map. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's right. This B, you could also think of it as a finite cover of the period domain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me, in the last five minutes, let me just tell you a tiny bit about, not really the proof of this whole theorem, but maybe I can just try to tell you where does this family of CY2 categories come from? So where do we get these interesting categories? And So construction, how do we construct this C? So there are, there are a couple steps to it, but the, the first step is uh, sort of, is something kind of fun. So I'm gonna start with my abelian surface A, uh, which is gonna be the one that happens at the fiber over zero. And there's a nice way to get, you know, a K3 surface from that, which is that Z mod two acts on this um, via the involution, which is just minus one, right? So there's an action on an abelian surface like that. And if you take the quotient and you resolve the singularities, you get a K3 surface. So that's called a Coomer K3 surface. Okay, and um, so wh basically what are we gonna try to do? You know, uh, what we're gonna, so I need to explain one more thing. So this, this has a really nice property, this construction. If you look at the equivariant category for this group action on the derived category of A, so explicitly 
what is this equivariant category? You look at pairs E comma phi, where E is an object in B of A, and phi is an isomorphism between E and I acting on E, such that the square of this is the identity. So this is some general thing. If you have a group action on a category, what is the invariant category? It's linearized objects in your category. So it's an object together with an isomorphism that squares to the identity. And this category has a really nice description. It turns out that this is equivalent to the derived category of S. So this is a, this follows from a famous theorem called the BKR theorem, Bridge, Lin, King, Reed. Um, you know, roughly the way you can think about this is that for a sort of formal reason, this is equivalent to the derived category of the quotient stack. The quotient stack you could think of as a crepent resolution of, of, uh, of this quotient, and S is also a crepent resolution. So there's some general conjecture saying that crepent resolution should be derived equivalent, and that's known in this particular case by a theorem by Bridging, Bridgeling, King, and Reed. So there is an equivalence like this, and why is that kind of useful? So that's useful for the following reason. Let me just use this board. I think I can use this board. Um, it's useful for the following reason, which I think is a little bit uh, funny the first time you see it. So we've expressed the derived category of S as an equivariant category of objects in A. And it turns out that whenever you have something like that, there's always a sort of dual description. There's an action of Z mod 2 on the derived category of S uh, such that the Z mod 2 invariants are equivalent to the derived category of A. So this is a result of Elegan. And uh, that might look kind of weird if you haven't thought about this before. So let me just explain why, why do you even have a natural Z mod 2 action. So in other words, we have this equivariant category, and I'm claiming that there's a natural action of Z mod 2 on that thing. Which, which should look a little bit weird, right? The Z mod 2 should have gone away when I took the fixed points of it. But they didn't, and the reason is that Z mod 2, let me think of it as plus or minus 1. So if I have an element chi in here, then I can act on an object E comma phi in a really silly way. You just multiply phi by chi. So you rescale this uh, linearization. So that defines an action of Z mod 2 on this category. And then it's a theorem that if you do the Z mod 2 invariance for that action, you actually get D of A itself back. So, so what I'm saying is that this abelian surface, you can express it as the invariant category for a Z mod 2 action on a K3 surface. That's the upshot of my discussion so far. And um, since uh, I'm kind of running out, I think I'm basically out of time, so let me try to say this in a really quick way. So the, the idea of the proof uh, of the theorem now is that you can deform the action of Z mod 2 on the derived category of D of S in a family of K3s let me call them curly S over B. So we have to show that. So I didn't tell you exactly what B is, but B turns out to be determined you know, in some way by this M here. And you can, you can find a family of K3 surfaces over this base, and this Z mod 2 action extends to an autoequivalence of this family of K3s. And once you do that, this, this category that we're interested in C is this the derived category of S, Z mod 2 invariance. So the moral is somehow that by thinking of, a, of an abelian, the derived category of an abelian surface as coming from a K3, you can use deformations of a K3 together with an autoequivalence to build new CY2 categories. Um, so anyway, so that's sort of the idea of the construction, and I'm out of time, so thanks for listening.